Friday Night Racing. On Off The Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. It's the only place to be on a Friday afternoon. It's Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball. Brought to you by HRI. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. And I'm delighted to say we've got Tom Malone with us in place of Johnny Ward this week. But our special guest is Colin Keane. Colin, good afternoon to you. How are you? How are you doing, Jerry? Not too bad now and yourself? I'm pretty good. All the better for having Tom Malone with us. Tom, how are you? Yeah, good, Jer. Good to be back. Well, you're very welcome, and you can do your lap of honour about the tote tend to follow a little bit later on. But speaking of laps of honour, Colin, uh, what's it been like since you broke the record? Uh, it's been it's been good, yeah. Uh, been, a lot of people have been c- congratulating me and stuff like that. But no, it's uh, it was brilliant to get it across the line. So it was about a month ago. It became clear that the, maybe even longer, sorry, maybe even six or eight weeks. It became clear that you were on track to do it. How do you how do you as the season unfolds? How do you keep it away from your thoughts, and how do you also at the same time kind of use it as a spur? What what's the balance in act? I suppose it kind of only came into the thought process after we we got over the hundred marker and still had. Uh, about five, six weeks left of the season. So we were just kind of hoping that things could keep going the way they were and that we'd get across the line, basically. And what, those numbers, right, Like, are they a motivation for you at the very start of the year? Because I know we've talked before and it's like, look, I want to beat the number that I had last year and if I do that, then I know that things are going in the right direction. But how important are the numbers actually when you sit down at the start of the year and how conscious are, we, are the specific numbers during the year? Uh, no, as I say, you, you start out each year trying to beat the previous year's tally and, and you hope to come the end of the year you get you get close somewhere, if not a bit better. Uh, but no, I, I think it depends a lot on the quality of the horses you're riding. This year we've we've rolled a lot of nice horses. Quality in the yard has got better. Uh, we've picked up the connection with Mr. Weld. And outside of that, my agent has done a very good job. Yeah, things are going well. Tom, can you put some context on it? Um, obviously, Colin's a little bit too humble here, but this is a remarkable achievement. Like, it's now put him right in the record books with the greatest names in the history of Irish flat racing. Yeah, and like the people who had this record before him, you're talking Joseph O'Brien broke it, a really long-standing record back in 2012, one that stood for, for Mick Canaan for years and years. So um, it, it must be quite the, the achievement because it's not just, you know, sort of broken. Remember when Colin, when you won your first um, jockey's title, a couple of years ago, it was the last day in Nace, and you had a load of friends and family on. I think the hundredth winner was literally your last winner, and everyone cheered you back. And it was a it was a really great day. I remember that. But I mean, this time, you know, is there even a is there even a, another number in your head at the back of this? Because, uh, like I said, it, it, the record's been well and truly obliterated now, and you still have nearly what a, a couple of weeks of season still to go. Yeah, so, so I suppose we're trying to set a new record at like that no one might get no one might beat it for a while um we'd love to get into the mid 130s if possible as you say we've another we've the guts of two weeks left in the season so so it is doable if if we can keep going the right direction i suppose another thing to, to bear in mind here like colin's had one over 800 rides this year and as well as all those winners like i think there's been over 100 seconds and over 100 thirds so I mean, 40% of the time Colin gets on a horse, it's going to finish on the podium, which I suppose, Colin, I mean, where where does the credit, is that Rory, like, is that, that your agent, does the credit go there? Or, I mean, that just must be a phenomenal feeling, even the, the confidence you must get. You kind of know that, you know, 40% of the time you're taking the, the right turn in the parade ring and you're going to be up there. Yeah, a lot of it would have to go to Rory, but it's people you ride for as well, knowing their horses, uh, being able to rely on their horses, like uh, the boss's horses, they're rock solid. They always turn up. They always run the race. Mr. Wells is the same. Riding for good trainers, riding nice horses, it's, it's a big help, so it is. Talk to us about, I, sorry, yeah, just, uh, about the year that Joe Lyons has had, because we, we had him on recently enough, and after he, he made his own uh, milestone, his career milestone, he was kind of unaware of it a little bit until somebody in the yard, I think it might have been his wife, had said, you know, this is actually quite a, a big number coming up and and then it became a thing it was in the middle of the season what did you you were aboard that that uh night in roscommon um it was a fire tell us what was that like from your perspective because you're delivering something very special for him for his history for the yard and it's kind of a big moment for everybody involved yeah we, pro- we probably thought it would happen earlier that week uh it was i thought we might i thought it might hit the 100 mark and he might hit his a thousand winner on the same night and i think it was nav nav and Earlier in the week, we had some nice two-year-olds running, and uh, one had won, and a few hit hit the crossbar. So it rolled on down to Roscommon, and 
Ofaya, he's he's a horse that always had plenty of ability, but had disappointed us on occasions. Uh, and it, I suppose it just kind of all fell fell right. He was very quick out with his stalls. He got an uncontested lead, and he was a good winner in the night. And it was great to get the bosses a thousand winner. And does it mean something special for the yard? Because I know you were all in the midst of the season, and there's big big races still to come. You're kind of in between a, a period of big races just gone and, and big races to come. So maybe there wasn't the opportunity to fully celebrate just yet. Uh, that's probably right. Yeah, you probably maybe at the end of the year when everything has calmed down a little bit and you look back and you'd, you'll appreciate what he, what he has achieved uh, and for the year that we've had. What What are your reflections on the year that you've had? Because, um, you know, obviously, I know you're, you're obviously very determined to set that 130 mark. Um, but when you look back at the start of the year and the last time we had you on, I know it was just the racing was just coming back and... Um, we didn't really know what it was going to be like. So now, looking back on the last 12, 14 months, you're getting on great. But what, what, what is it that is letting you hit the peak that you're at at the moment, do you think? It's, it's the quality of horse, I think. Uh, this, this year, we've we have had a lovely bunch of two-year-olds. I think he's, if he's not in front, he might be second aid on numbers of runners to winners for two-year-olds. Uh, a lot of quality in, in amongst them. And like we wouldn't be in this position without them, so they make the job a lot, a bit easier. Do you know their quality when you're riding them out? Like as soon as they arrive, are you like, "Ooh, this is pretty good," or do they all develop at different points? And you're thinking, you're hopeful, but you're never quite sure until they're actually in the race. Yeah, that's it. They all develop at different times, and <clears throat> you never know until they're at the race course. Some some horses can be machines for one, for a better word, at home, and don't bring us the race courses. And uh, and it can be the other way around. Some horses slide under the radar and turn it on at the race courses, and that's where you want to be turning it on. And that's that's the main. I think that's where most success has come from this year with them two-year-olds. Again, the last time we had John, you were talking about the fact that um, the the early part of the season had been wiped out because of of lockdown and and COVID in 2020, and that actually uh, in your guys' yard, the the horses tend to be prepared, ready to go early in the season. Um, this year they've been ready to go early in the season ready to go in the middle of the season and they're still going at the end of the year as well so it's obviously been fairly spectacular in terms of that crop of two year olds well that's it uh, we've uh, they had been ready to go early in the year and he just the boss kept giving them more time and time because if he thought they were ready when they were he thought maybe another two weeks three weeks they would, they'll even be more ready so he was he was very patient with them and they've uh, they've definitely paid him back that, for that uh, as as the, you can tell on the, his, his stats this year. How much are you enjoying this at the moment? Like, how, how do you feel like you're in the zone? Is, is it, because it's such a weird scenario where for two and a half minutes, everything goes perfectly and you win a race. For two and a half minutes, everything goes perfectly and you can finish second or third. And the difference in how you feel and, re- and respond to that must be quite significant. Yeah, uh, we're, we're definitely enjoying it. Obviously, we're, we're riding a lot of winners, riding for good people and nice horses. So if, if we weren't in giant, I think there'd be something wrong. And that relationship you, you mentioned with Dermot Weld, how did that come about? I suppose, obviously, Tarnawa was where it kind of set off. We are in the right place at the right time to get on her. And then when we came home during the winter, uh, Mr. Weld approached Chair and asked him about it. And they kind of came up with an agreement together and it went from there. Is that unusual enough or is that something that would happen for a lot of people? Obviously, because, you know, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar, Gerlines essentially made you stable jockey when you were still an apprentice. So there's a, a deep relationship there. Yeah, it's, pro- it's probably un- unusual enough. Um, most most stables will have their own riders or retained riders. Uh, but look, we're, we're not complaining. We're, we're in a very fortunate position. We're riding for two of the biggest shards in the country at the moment and a lot of nice horses. And is there um, a... Sorry, Jeremy. I might just come in on that and how unique that is. I mean, it's 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 just a compliment. He wouldn't say it, but it's just a compliment to Colin on his abilities and how in demand he is. Because you think about it, he's had what three Group One winners over the course of the last twelve months, and uh, they've been for Dermot Weld, Aidan O'Brien, and Noel Mead, like a variety of yards away from Geraldine's yard. So you think of the careers of jockeys over the last few years and the, the it's only the very, very, very select few who are allowed, um, you know, to be to, to move around and, and be used by several top yards at the same time because often they try and keep this talent for themselves. So it's a great reflection on both Colin's ability and you'd have to say Jura as well and on his willingness to allow Colin to go and, and ride for other yards when available. 
yeah, it does speak to a good relationship with your lines that you guys trust each other enough that you're going to end up back together on the big days. No, that's it, yeah. Like, Jer is my first port to call. Uh, but at the same time, if if he thinks his horse isn't going to win or doesn't have a chance, he'd be the first man to tell you to get off it. He's 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 a great boss to be working for. And he, all, he, all he wants to see is, see is me, me ride winners. So I, I'm in a very fortunate position. When you're looking at uh, the next race that you've uh, a ride booked in, What's the work that you're doing in terms of the analysis of the opposition? And is that the bit, when I was talking about enjoying it, obviously you enjoy the winners and the success that's coming, but it's the meat and drink of the actual job itself. Is that bit enjoyable at the moment? And does that involve a lot of research on the opposition or are you mostly focused on just making sure that your horse delivers what it's capable of? Oh, well, you, 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 look, you look through your, your horse's form, if it's run or if it's first, say for a maiden, if it's a first time ever, then you look at, what has ran in the race where you're drawn, what trainer has runners who's riding them. So no, it's it's the same for, for every day, for every race. Uh, you just, you have your homework done basically. And I know, again, we spoke to you last time, you'd been looking back at a lot of stuff uh, over lockdown and, and kind of just checking back on it. Is is that part of the race, the the build up to races, that's actually more enjoyable where you're, you're sitting just watching to see how the opposition works and see what traits they have so that in the middle of a race, you can almost respond subconsciously to what they're doing. Yeah, you can. I suppose you can. I suppose sometimes you can you can look into that too much. Maybe you kind of go out with your own plan, and when the stalls open, that that could go completely out the window. So you kind of have to go to plan B. So some days, some days you have to make it up as you go along, and hopefully it's right. And other days it won't be right. Do you have a style? Do you, do you like? Is there a discernible style that you would describe as how you like to ride in a race? Uh, I suppose different trainers have different traits, if you want to say. Uh, for Jair's horses, they're very straightforward. We do a lot of stall work at home, they're fit, so they jump well usually. We don't like to take them back. We keep it very simple as possible, and if they're good enough, they'll win nine times out of ten. So it does sound like if if part of the job is obviously analysing exactly who's in the race to know when they're going to go or when they're going to be able to go or if they're not going to be able to go, if that's good for you. But it sounds like mostly your job is to make sure that your horses run their own races and that's where the confidence comes from. Yeah, exactly. You're riding, riding your horse to its, its own strengths and the way it's maybe trained. As I say, different trainers have different traits to train them or the way they're like to ridden. So you do, do what suits them. In the middle of a season like this, how do you get away from it or is it all racing all the time? Like, How, how do you get that work-life balance that everybody talks about being really important and, and just make sure that you're not kind of burning out at any stage during it? Yeah, no, when we're not racing, we try to, we're well able to relax. Uh, we either we go out for dinner or meet up with friends, things like that. We When we have off time, we try to enjoy it. You know? Away from racing, or is it is it very much a bubble as well? Because like with COVID and all the stuff and all the precautions, pe- people have kind of definitely uh, our our circle of friends and our social lives have definitely contracted a little bit. And um, maybe fingers crossed, everything's about to open up a little bit more for us in, in the coming weeks. Would you have been in a, a bit of a racing bubble anyway before COVID? Uh, I suppose. Well, I obviously we have friends in racing, and I have friends from my own town at home. So. It, they're be the only two bubbles, but to be fair, the, the lads that we hang around with at home are into racing anyway, so it's 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 pretty much all the one, to be honest. Yeah, very good. And then the other thing that I'm always interested in, in terms of the Irish jockeys, when you have success like this, are you constantly looking at what's going on in England with an eye to there as part of the future, or because of the quality of racing and because of the quality of um, the breeding that we have here, you know that you're going to be on horses that are always going to be competitive in Group 1s into the future. Is England on your radar at all? Uh, no, not not necessarily. Uh, the, the only thing, to be honest, I keep on a look at is the the championship going on at the moment, minute between William Buick and Oshin Murphy. It's, it's it's really heating up at the moment. But I think there's only two winners, and it's only tomorrow. I think is the last day for it, so that'll be interesting. But there's no pangs of oh geez, I wouldn't mind being involved in that competition at some point. Uh, unless unless I'm asked to go or if there's a horse I'm riding is going, yeah. I, I, that would be the only thing that would keep me in. That would interest me in it, to be honest. So one offs, absolutely, but not for not for so able to lock, stock, and barrel. Yeah, one offs. Yeah, yeah, not for long, long term. Yeah, say. yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense. Well, especially when things are going so well. I, I just a general question about why things are going so well in Ireland at the moment. Um, we do seem to have a, a new kind of cohort of jockeys who are your age and a little bit younger who are coming through 
who are reaching spectacular heights very quickly. What do you put that down to? I don't know. Yeah, each year the the quality of apprentice seems to be getting better. Yeah, smart. I suppose in Ireland a lot of it is to do with pony racing. You can, I'd say, if you name the top five apprentices in Ireland, they've all done pony racing. Uh, it's a big thing over here. I did it. A lot of the senior lads have, have even done it. I've done it, I should say. But yeah, the, some of the apprentices coming through at the moment are very smart. Look to be very smart riders. And is that something that keeps you all on your toes? That like makes sure that you get up and you you're doing your strength and conditioning work and looking after your diet as well? Or uh, yeah, yeah, they they make you probably more hungry there that they're chopping at your heels. And what is I was always worrying on. about that. Sorry, uh, like the the Irish way room. It's completely changed now. I mean, you're sort of in it what about a decade now, realistically. And I mean, so much talent has gone from it. But the, the the new talent that's in there, how do you kind of kind of feel where you sit in there? Because you are, you know, a repeat champion at this stage. Joseph's gone, tonic has gone. You know, obviously poor Pat Small and Lord Raston, but a lot of big retirements. I mean, even though you are one of the more, more experienced riders in there, it is kind of quite a, a young way room all the same, isn't it? You think of the likes of Ben Cohen, you know, he's got a big job now, but he's not that long in an apprenticeship rank. Uh, it, it is quite a young way in Ireland in particular. Yeah, it is. Yeah, like like that, as you say. When, when you have some of the apprentices coming up to you and asking you advice or asking you about horses, you have to, you, I don't know, maybe it makes you feel older than you are. Uh, <laughs> Tom was very politely calling you old there, Colin. I don't know if you picked up on it. <laughs> I think so, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, look, you, you, you're all right. You've got the likes of Kevin Manning and Shelby Heffernan who are old. <laughs> you know, they, I don't, are they ever going to go? But, uh, you know, Niall McCullough in there as well. So you're okay. You're not at that level yet, Colin. Not yet, no, thankfully. 27 year old veteran. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. but I mean, that, that's the thing about it. I mean, the way room, the flat way room, it, it does have guys who, who will be around there for a long time, but it does seem kind of strange at the moment that there's so many prominent Irish jockeys that are younger, yourself included, Colin. You know, I'm calling you one of the older guys, and you're, you're only 27. Yeah, exactly. Like, as you said, Kevin Manning, Niall McCullough, Shamie Heffernan, and Declan McDonough, they're all. They're the more, we'll say, more senior lads, uh, and they're they're top lads. If you ever have a problem or need to talk to them, they're, they're very approachable men, and you can understand why they're in the game so long. Do you know? Um, I I wanted to ask you. There was there was two things I wanted to ask you. One was um, Andy Lee used to tell us about. So I don't know if you've ever seen Andy Lee be an interview, but he's like literally the world's nicest man, a complete gent, and his job was to be. Uh, a boxer to try and concuss his opponent and we were always like trying to understand how he goes from being the world's nicest man to a knockout artist and he said on the ring walk there's a transformation that happens so the point goes from the the changing room the ring you walk into the ring and then by the time he gets to the ring he's hyped himself up that he knows that his job is to try and knock out his opponent with you guys your your mates in the weigh room your mates off the the course but that bit just before the race starts, you have to become something of an assassin to try and beat them. And it's obviously been unbelievably successful for you. So 300 odd times this year in the money in Ireland. What's the psychological transformation? What happens in your mind to make you super competitive for that two and a half, minute and a half, three minutes, however long the race is? I suppose you, like that, we're all, we're all friends in the weigh room and off horses. But when, when we're on them in the stalls, we're ultra competitors, uh, obviously within reason, but no, you, yeah, firstly, I think you, you keep it safe, but sportsmanship at the same time. And like, well, is, is there sort of a moment, I mean, when you're legged up and is, is, it, is that kind of the time, because you'll see you guys coming out of the weigh room and there'll be a bit of chat, a bit of laughing, and then, you know, you go get to the owners and then is it sort of like, you know, we're on the way to post now, this is when the sort of the game face comes on or whatever. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, as you as you get your leg up or as you're down towards the, the start or even at the stalls, it uh, starts to get a bit of quieter, lads get serious heads on them and, you know, the game faces on. And are you still chatting to people or listening to people in the stalls? At what point do you kind of tune out from that and just be at one with the animal? Well, you'd probably still be chatting away to the lads around you, trying to, trying, to be, trying to be relaxed and chatting to the animal to try and keep it relaxed as well. But once the stalls open, it's... It's it's game on from there from then I think. And the other thing that like in the in the TV we always see um, people chatting in the races. Are you are, can you hear anything that's happening when you're in the middle of a race? Unless something is going wrong and there's someone screaming at you, that's that's about tight that you'll hear. And what are you, what are you thinking about? 
what am I thinking about? Uh, well, when you're, sure what you're thinking about when you're riding them is you're trying to trying to keep uh, your horse in the rhythm, trying to keep it smooth and get them to finish in the best possible position. Well, I suppose, Colin, like the difference, I guess, with a, a, a flat, like the, the, that kind of thought process, if you're whipping along sort of between 10 and 12 seconds of furlong, it's, it's only, you know, you might only have five, six, seven furlongs. I mean, to normal people, I guess, it was even it feels things happen incredibly quickly. When do you kind of find that? I mean, I think it's like of say Cisco in the Guineas and you know, you're running down a road and you haven't got a gas. I mean, what what is those kind of how is the thought process there when everything around you is going a million miles an hour and you're like, Oh my god, I just need to find a gap here? Yeah, I suppose when when it's happening quick and you're you're trying to I suppose as you say, you're looking for a gap, you're just trying to not that you have much time, but say take a deep breath, relax, and hope that it does go right, hope that the gaps come for you, because nine times out of ten, if you're on the best horse, he, you will be able to, he'll be able to get you out of trouble. Siskin, is, as you say, is the prime example, because uh, it all unfolded at the right time, and once the gap appeared, he was able to get in and get out within a couple of strides. So... At, That's the dream have... situation, I guess, when you find yourself in that problem, is it? <laughs> Sorry? That's the dream scenario that you you have one that does just have tons of ability underneath you and you just get you out of a hole. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's the dream is right. The um the the bit in the middle of all that where you're kind of uh calm and uh and still at the same time trying to find a tiny gap where most people wouldn't even be able to see one. Are you hooked up to monitors? Are you are you taking stats? Are you on a heart rate monitor? Are you interested in that side of it at all, or is it still kind of all mostly feel and experience for you? Uh, it's all feel and experience. No, we're we're not a th- or we don't have any of them heart monitors or anything like that on us. No. And is that you something know? you might be interested in down the line, or is it actually an alien uh, world, and so therefore not something that you think would suit you? Uh, for for me, it, it wouldn't be for me. Now, I wouldn't I wouldn't have any interest in it to be honest. Right, you you don't want to know. You're you're actually, for you, it it's an internal thing. You're all kind of almost your own internal clock is more important. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Right, I Colin, just something on that. I mean, I've heard like I don't know how Jerry uses them at home, but like some people would use heart monitors on the horse to 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 monitor them to to see how they're kind of going and stuff like that. Have we have you ever used any of that kind of stuff in homework or? say timed homework or any of that or is again is it all just sort of done by feel and that relationship between the kind of rider and the trainer and what feedback you give to him yeah no we we don't use any of that at home uh like that it's it's probably about to do with the rider and the trainer like uh we we i know our gallop by the back from the back of my hand and jerry knows by jerry knows by looking at the work even when you after work pull up come back to him he can really tell you what i'm going to say to him you know he he knows the gallop so well, and know, he's able to. He's a great eye for the work. Basically, is the easiest way of saying it. That must feel great yeah. being in the middle of that, though. That like everybody actually understands each other so well, and you understand the animals so well, and then the success comes at the end of it. There must be incredible confidence in the work that you're doing and the quality of work that you're doing. Well, that's it. Yeah, when when the horses work to a level, and you say what you think, and then they go to the track and do what you think they're going to do. It's it's very, uh, it's very pleasing, and as you say, it gives you confidence. So then you're able to, you're you're more confident in your own ability. I'd, I'd one last thing: the the life of a jockey. We, we've had countless jockeys on the show over the last three or four years who've come and told us the stories of their difficulties, and um, I, I'm always interested to see how you keep those kind of ups and downs at bay, just to kind of be as as laid back as you clearly are and, and to be enjoying it as much as you are There's a, there is like that constant adrenaline in your life three four nights a week where something amazing happens and it can be difficult to get to sleep afterwards it can be difficult to come down after it so are you conscious of the fact that so many people in your profession have had mental health difficulties or battles with addiction is that something that you kind of just need to work on you need to mind your mental health as much as you need to mind your physical health yeah definitely it's it's i think it's a big thing in our sport for me personally i don't try I don't try to get too high or too low, because uh, on on the good days, you, obviously it's it's a great trail, but on not so good days, you can be very low. So I try to keep somewhere in the middle. But yeah, unfortunately, it's a big thing in our support, and which I think that the turf club and the doctors are trying to, to trying to help out with. And is is physical fitness part of your making sure that your equilibrium is there? Is that something that you do separate to riding out? I suppose it is. Yeah, just the more fitter you are. 
and more you, you're conscious and the weight is supposed to more sweat less sweating i should say you have to do so it, it all rolls into one i think the one thing that, is, sorry Jared, on, yeah. one thing, i think um on the sweating side of things i think covid colin correct me wrong but for a long time there was no access to saunas for jockeys so i know we spoke to sean flanagan about this he said his weight actually stabilized for the lack of uh, sauna has not been used so did you have to make make any, I know you don't have that much trouble with your weight anyway it's quite even but uh, did you have any issues with your weight or any changes you have to make because of stuff like sauna is not available no yeah the saunas they're still out of action I I didn't really use them much at the race I kind of had my sweat and done before I, I got to the races so it, it didn't really make much of a difference to me uh, but like that you see some lads seem to be happier without the saunas at the moment for some reason, I suppose because they have their, their, they're probably more conscious of their weight. Maybe. Yeah, you don't have the the ability to suddenly rescue things with a bit of a crash just before things, and you, maybe it's longer term planning and embracing the the nutritionist advice and all that kind of stuff, which will definitely help some people in the in the long run. Well, listen, we wish you the very best of luck. I know you're in the middle of it. The one thing that strikes me is that you might end up regretting setting a massive record that you're not able to beat next year if it's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, you're you're probably right there. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be careful what you wish for sometimes. Well, look, congratulations. It couldn't happen to a, a nicer character. Thanks a million for joining us today. Cheers. Really appreciate it. No Cheers, Colin. Cheers, Tom. That's uh, Colin Keane there, uh, Ireland's champion jockey, in the middle of breaking his record, uh, taking the time out to chat to us. And, and one of the most unassuming people we've had in the show uh, ever, really, Tom. Um, I think for anybody listening who's uncertain, this is one of the greatest... Irish sports performances this year and if you look back and you mentioned the, the people whose records he's breaking it's a record that was set by Joseph O'Brien and previous to that it was a record set by Mick Canaan so it is a spectacular level of success Yeah and it's kind of awkward you know you do really have to kind of pay compliments to when they're sitting there obviously but like he is a ludicrous talent and there's no getting away from that I mean I know Kevin Blake said it on ITV a couple of weeks ago and you know it was clipped for social media and that sort of thing but like he is, for my money, like he's definitely one of the best jockeys in Europe at the moment. There's no doubt about that. He is kind of the generational talent. Um, you know, you talk about the success that Jerry Lyons has with his two-year-olds in particular. The way Colin Keane rides two-year-olds in races, it's just phenomenal. He is just, he is, he's, a, he's just a very, I, and there's no other way to read, he's just kind of a, a very tender jockey. He just educates these two-year-olds in such a brilliant way that he almost kind of tricks them into having a race and they, they have such a positive race course experience. And, uh, I mean, that, he is one of the key reasons why, you know, Ger Lyons and himself is such a, you know, such a brilliant striker with two-year-olds this season. And just thinking back as well, there's so many great performances from different horses that it's had for different trainers, like, you know, search for a song, bounce back to form under Colin Keane. And Monique, there's a group two winner for Jack Davison as well. Like, he gave her a brilliant ride. And was, you're talking about as well his style. And it's just, he doesn't have a style. He can just do anything. He can jump off from the front and make all. He can drop one out the back and finish like a train. He can, you know, he can stick up with the pace. He can move out with the pace. He can take it wide. He'll make his own decisions. Um, I mean, you're talking about good rides. Remember, we were in, I was in Nace, just there was a time towards the end of August when Colin King was basically having a double or a treble what seemed like every single day of the week, just winners, winners, winners. And, you know, he goes into a 45 to 65, like one of the lower grades races, and, like, he just gives this horse, of Aloysius uh, Lilius, I think the horse's name was, he just picked it up from, from a, a furlong and a half out at Nace, just something you don't normally do at Nace, and he did it. Again, basically grade race, just outpaught everyone else. And, you know, kicks her home and it's another winner off the list. And again, it's not one that's ever going to make the headlines, but it just, for me, struck as like this guy is just so tactically versatile and talented. And yeah, it, the world is his oyster. Uh, really, like he said, he doesn't really want to go and, and, and ride in England at the moment. But realistically, you know, he could probably take the Judmont job and, and do the kind of, you know, Pat Smolin or Ruby Walsh type thing where you ride, you know, the big Saturday meetings in the UK if required. And, he, yeah, he, he really is just an excellent talent. Yeah, and, and maybe he'll be ready for that whenever it comes. Maybe he won't want to do it whenever it comes. There's no there's no impetus, like no requirement to do it, certainly the level of success that he's had this year and over the last number of years. And again, the fact that he's able to be freed up to go and ride for other big trainers on their best horses in the biggest races is the type of thing that will inspire loyalty and, and uh, keep my airlines for much longer. So it's, um, it's one of those kind of, it's another bit of... Um, 
brilliant management from uh, Ger Lyons of, of a talent. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that just struck me as well. Ger's like, well, oh, look, mine probably won't win this. You can go and ride a better horse. I mean, what a what a vote of confidence to get. Like, like they're so, like, that's just leadership, isn't it? Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, that's management. That's leadership. That's, it's just, uh, it's just so, and it's kind of slightly rare to see in horse racing. We do tend to be a little bit blinkered and just focus on our own horses with, oh, maybe, look, maybe if things go really right for this fella, he might run a good race. But, like, that's one of the great things about Jura as well, that he's just, he's he's definitely unique in the way he does things and the way he thinks about things. And like that, you know, now this this fella doesn't have a great chance, Colin, you know, you, you jump off him and, and if you've got a better option, take the better option. Yeah, for sure. A reminder, Friday Night Racing is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. If you're listening on the radio and you want to get in touch, 53106 is the text number. Of course, you can always uh, get us on Twitter, at Off The Ball. There's a few other things that we should talk about that are happening um, in the uh, general world. This uh, We mentioned, um, Colin brought up there, the, the race for the UK Flat Jockey Championship and it's come right down to the final day and um, Ascot is going to be excellent tomorrow the racing the quality of racing and there's some interesting Irish horses involved as well um, but we should talk about what happened during the week with Oshin Murphy um, he's just obviously had some difficulties uh, that we know about the, the ban for cocaine and he's been breathalyzed in the path, past and he was breathalyzed again just recently as well so um, this would be a bit concerning I suspect uh, if you know if, if this pattern of behaviour persists yeah, it, it's, it's a big concern. Um, I think it was last Friday at Newmarket, um, Ushi Murphy was bre- failed a breathalyzer test on the way into Newmarket Racecourse, and then he was stood down for the rest of the day on Friday. Now he's back racing again on, on Saturday. It's worth pointing out that, I mean, and this is no, you know, it's just no endorsement. The, the level that is required to pass for riding is a, is a more stringent level than it would be for driving. So he actually would have passed the breathalyzer test if he'd been stopped at a checkpoint on the side of the road. But he was over the limit for driving. Now, the other point about this is about one o'clock in the day when this breathalyzer was administered. So, you know, you can you can extract what you want from that as well. But it is concerning. It's the second time he's failed a breathalyzer test. He also had the incident with a cocaine ban as well at the back end of last year. Things have been going well generally for Oshin Murphy. Obviously, he was top of the Jockeys' Championship, continues to be, although as far as I, I think that lead is only now down to one as it stands at the moment. So it's going to be a phenomenal battle between himself and William Buick uh, tomorrow at, um, at Ascot for Champions Day. But um, Oshin Murphy is, is, is kind of like a brand in racing at this stage. So um, he's, 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 a, he's very much a poster boy. He's a big job with Qatar Racing. He's... He's very much an international star of the sport. Um, he has, you know, a big following in Asia and Japan. He's gone over to Japan and Hong Kong and the like uh, on winter stints and very, very successful over there. So as high-profile global stars of the sport go, Ushin Murphy is right up there. So it is slightly concerning that he has now failed to breathalyze the test and had a cocaine ban in the space of the last sort of, what, two and a half years. Yeah, and now look, uh, a certain roguishness has always been um, uh, alluring when it comes to sports people and their brand. So uh, hopefully everything is under control and he's okay and um, we don't need to worry about that. But in terms of that race itself, and it, it strikes me that you, you're talking about the jockeys being brands. We Frankie Dettori in the show a couple of weeks ago and like there's somebody who's in his 50s still riding away at that level. So these jockeys particularly in the flat, have the opportunity to become super famous in comparison to the horses who are obviously very short-lived in terms of their public um, consciousness. That you know you, They're here until they're uh, good enough to be put out stood and then 18 months later in some cases and 10, 12 races in some cases, it's like, right, off you go and we never hear from you again until we're looking at your uh, grandkids. Uh, with, with Colin Keane and with Ushi Murphy, there's actually an extra pressure then on the jockeys over a period of time because people don't back the horse, they back the jockey in the flat. Yeah, it's very much so. It's like you said, you know, like who are the who are the greatest flat horses in the last, you know, decade or fifteen years? Frankel and and, and see the stars. See the stars retired at three, Frankel retired at four. You know, we only got to see, you know, see the stars six times in his three year old career. Frankel what fourteen times in all. So, you know, between those two horses, you're talking about a lot less than twenty five runs between the pair of them in their lives. So 
it is very much up to the sport to sell its long-term stars. And realistically, at the moment, that is Frankie de Tori. You know, we had him at Bellies Town there uh, a couple of weeks ago for for the for for Barney Curley's thing, and it just uh, it, it was unbelievable. He completely, totally, he'd already stole the show. So yeah, Frankie de Tori, and what 50 years of age, he is still the biggest role in European uh, horse racing. But uh, it's intriguing to see. You know, Colin, I don't like obviously Colin Keane is never going to be a Frankie de Tori from that sort of, um, you know, limelight hugging kind of way. He's far more humble and down to earth kind of person, but uh, he's certainly the kind of person that just lets his riding do the talking. Uh, whereas Oshin Murphy maybe is sort of slightly, obviously, more out there uh, from a promotional point of view than um, than Frankie de Tori or than, than, than Colin Keane, but uh, it's intriguing to see what will happen with the pair of them over the next again again that's it we were, we'll have the next the, the pair of them for in the next 20 odd years yeah. or so the way things go with flat jockeys you know yeah. um you know it's particularly successful ones they, they can easily ride into their into their mid to late 40s uh, who's going to win that i mean murphy's one ahead i think is he yeah he's one ahead so um william buick probably has a marginally better book of rides tomorrow um but it, it could actually come down to the uh could actually come down to maybe the champions like the qe2 itself tomorrow but um one each one each would probably be a, maybe a realistic or maybe a, a one nil for either side tomorrow because there's it's only a six race card of that tomorrow so it's not like they have a load of chances and one of the strange aspects one of the aspects of COVID in the uk as well um, jockeys are now not allowed to do two meetings in a day. So uh, as part of, you know, those welfare measures we talked about in, in racing um, before, they, the likes of when Richard Hughes and that would have been chasing uh, jockeys typing, you could go and ride up to 10 times a day and you could do two meetings in one day. So that they're not allowed to do that anymore. So it does actually kind of make for these more um, like tighter contests and, and where we get a where we get these um, opportunities for lads to, to not kind of streak clear by, you know, trying to take 70 rides in a week or whatever. When um, the uh, listeners tonight are sitting on their couch tomorrow at looking at Champions Day, what are the highlights going to be? What should they be looking out for? Oh, the Champions Stakes itself is an absolutely phenomenal race. Um, I think every horse in the race is rated north of 114, which is just incredible. We've Two horses rated, we three horses rated over 125, uh, which is just just absolutely brilliant. And we're going to have what Mishriff up against Adiar. So it's just such an unbelievably deep, deep race. And uh, there's that, there's long distance cup, but probably maybe the last time we see Stradivarius. And um, the QE2 is, is over a mile. That's another brilliant uh, race. You got Edna Brown's got a couple of runners like the Snowfall in the, in the Phillies and Mares as well. So, um, it's a very, very good uh, day's racing. Champions Day in the UK is a relatively new initiative. It's, this is its 10th year. It's been blighted by issues. Most most are in the going. It's run on heavy going quite a few times. That's just, you know, you're running race day at the end of October, start of November. In England, it's quite highly likely you're going to get very heavy going. So that's kind of blighted it from a spectacle point of view in the past. They won't have that this year. They've got good to soft going. They have absolutely brilliant lineups for their field. So, uh, and obviously then you, you have the, the added drama of the Buick versus uh, Oshin Murphy title race going down to the wire. So um, it has plenty of storylines. And uh, look, hopefully, like, I'd like to see maybe Adiar come out on top as the pro- proper champion three-year-old. That'd be really good to see. Um, as a, you know, I don't know whether he's going to be around next year. But uh, you could definitely count him as, as the champion three-year-old, you know, going on and he won a derby. He can then be followed up during the summer uh, in those all-age events and then to go and win a champion stake would be a really nice way to, for him. I don't know if he'll sign off. I think they might keep him around next year as well, but they have Hurricane Lane too. So so who knows? But um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be good to see how, this, how that all pans out tomorrow. OK, one last thing about the, the flat season. The COVID shortened year, and I kind of alluded to this a bit when we were talking about Colin a little bit earlier on, it obviously meant that we didn't get as much information about last year's uh, two-year-olds rising three and the, uh, the this crop this year. It felt like we had a bit of a bumper year in the flat. Am I wrong about that? Yeah, it was, it's, 
It's kind of strange to assess. I mean, I think the the real story this year has been the re-emergence of Godolphin as a superpower. Um, you know, Charlie Appleby has just had the most brilliant year. He probably is the best two-year-old in training in Native Trail, who won on uh, Longshore House Champions Weekend, and then, of course, he followed up in the Dewhurst. Um, he, he won the Irish Derby and the English Derby. He's got Addy Iron Highland Re- and, um, uh, sorry, Hurricane Lane. Uh, so the re-emergence of Godolphin um, as a force is definitely one of the key storylines. And um, from an Irish point of view, again, but Colin and what he's done and what he's achieved and those numbers are just incredible on the Irish side. And there's been a, a very much a spreading of the wealth. Um, you know, you, you, like Jessica Harrington had an unbelievable year. You talk about Champions Weekend in Ireland. Um, you had Jill Lines had four winners on the on the day. Jessica Harrington won two Group Ones. Aidan O'Brien hasn't had the greatest year. He's had a good year, but probably, you know, he's obviously still going to be champion trainer in Ireland, but others have eaten into his power base and, the, and particularly like the Jessica Harrington, Chair Lyons, uh, Eddie Lyons got a group one this year. Great to see him do that. Adam McGinn has picked up a group one. That was another brilliant story in uh, on Arc Day. Um, you've seen some young trainers, like I mentioned uh, movie, uh, movie star there, um, or Munista rather for Jack Davidson, like to see him get a get a group two win in the car as well. So good young trainers. Um, like the, the criticism that's always leveled in Irish racing is, that, oh, well, you know, you'll have to come over and take on Aidan O'Brien. It's a, it's a one-man show. And like this year has just shown yeah. beyond doubt that it really isn't the O'Brien show. I mean, it's not just, obviously his sons are challenging him now with, with Joseph and Gunica, but you know, the emergence of Jer, like Jessica Harrington's just gone to a completely different level of quality of animal in her in her stable as well. Just with the owners and the, the buying power she's uh, seemed to got at the yearling sales in the last couple of years in particular, and she's really sort of seen the benefits of that. Um, you know, and like I said, then you, you have you know, Adam McGuinness as well. He has just come on to the next level to see him get get that group on. And it's, like I said, it's been a, a good spreading of the wealth over the course of the over the course of the season this year. All right, there's one last bit of business that we need to get into. I'm gonna, just going to read the script. The biggest names in flat racing will line up at Ascot on Saturday to decide which member of the OTB team takes the bragging rights in this year's tote to tend to follow. Bolshoi Bally for Johnny Ward goes head to head with Mishra for me in the champion stakes, while Tom, that's you, has favourite Palace Pier running in the day's other bonus points race, the QE2 stakes, as one door closes, another one opens with the jumps tote to tend to follow opening for entries at the end of the month. We'll talk to you a bit more about that later on in the year you can keep an eye on tote.ie for more Tom it's not even close anymore and it looks like you're going to lap us with Palace Pier yeah Palace Pier is good I actually thought about it but like Batash really let me down as well and I had considered putting in Oxstead in my tent fall but look it's, a, it's been a very good year it's been a very good year and uh, I'm certainly I'm certainly very happy to be to be top of that table well unless you're going to Devon Lockett somehow I'm willing right now <laughs> to crown you champion uh, ahead of champion day so well done Tom and thanks for entering yeah, well, look, thanks, Jer. Do you want a couple of winners this weekend? Yes, of course we do. We always do. Go for it. Oh, good, good. Well, I, I think like, Colin actually has some brilliant rides over the course of the weekend and all of the um, pattern action. But I mentioned Search for a Song, who kind of bounced back to form from Moidler um, last time I had the Cura. Um, another horse called Homeless Songs, Colin will ride as well for uh, for Dermot Weld and the Moidler colours. He's quite disappointing on uh, Lungeon Irish Champions of the weekend, but uh, he's by Frankel. He's, uh, he runs at Leopardstown at quarter past three on Saturday. So I think homeless songs will definitely bounce back to form. I saw on the price there, he's around about three to one. So um, I'd imagine he'll go off shorter than that. And the other, the other horse I like is actually at Ascot, Frankie Dettori in the last um, horse called Sunray Major at Ascot at half past four. It's in the Balmoral Handicap. And you're, you'll be familiar with any of the stuff we've done over the last year is you're always looking for a group horse in a handicap and if this fella is not a group horse in a handicap I don't know what is but uh, yeah Sun Ray Major at Ascot at 4.30 and at Leopardstown on Saturday quarter past three homeless songs and hopefully crown my uh, crown my brilliant year after the 10 to follow it as well Tom great to have you back thanks a million <laughs> thanks Jer Tom alone with us this week in place of Johnny Ward he'll be back with us next week but great to have Tom back as a friend of the show Friday Night Racing is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland we'll see you next Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock on all of our social channels and then again of course on Friday evenings at 8 o'clock on Off the Ball on News Talks Friday Night Racing on Off the Ball and Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie.